Welcome to the continuation of the overview of research methods in, in psychology. In this section, we we'll have an overview of some of the non-experimental methods, which includes observational method, survey, cross-sectional design, case studies, and the rest. So let's quickly start with the observational method or observational studies. So observational study is a field research which involves a close surveillance of a phenomenon of interest. And here we have two types. We have naturalistic observation and participants observation. In observation, what you are doing is that you just want to see what is happening there. You want to see, and there are two ways. You can sit behind and see what is happening, or you can take part in it at the same time seeing it. So naturalistic observation occurs in the natural setting where the behavior is being studied. So here it involves observing and recording the behavior of people or animal in their natural environment. Those under study most of the time are not aware that they are being studied. That is what we refer to as unobtrusive unobtrusiveness. That is, participants are not aware that they are being studied, yet we are studying them. This has some ethical you know, implications, which later we'll get to see in the ethics slides that we'll, we'll look at. So here, you do not take part in it. You just sit. Perhaps students want to go on demonstration. You can just go and sit at a point. As they pass by, you observe how they are behaving, and you record. You can video them, you can take notes and stuff like that. You will not take part in the demonstration. That is naturalistic observation. And because they are not aware that they are being studied, much of the time, you know, the behaviors that they exhibit become so real. They become so real. Because once they know that you are studying them, their reaction change what we call reactivity effect. They will try to now res restrict the kind of behaviors that they exhibit. So it's very good if you, know, you plan the studies so carefully that they are not aware that, you are be that they are being studied. They will exhibit the real behavior that you want to, to get. And then we have the participants' observation. Here, the researcher actively takes part in the behavior of interest and record the relevant information. So in participants' observation, the researcher does two things. It's both an active participant, take place an active role in whatever behavior you, know, you want to study, and then at the same time, it's a researcher recording it. So for example, students want to go on demonstration, you join them. Whatever charging they are doing, you also part of it. You also shout and move with them. At the same time, you'll be recording what is going on. So it's more or less like you know, the kind of undercover journalism, perhaps, that Anas has been doing. He takes part in it. He offers people the bribe. At the same time, he'll record you and put you into trouble. So that is participants' observation. You take part, active member of the behavior of interest and the researcher as well. So here, most of the time, the advantage, the biggest advantage when it comes to observational study is that you get the real behavior. There's nothing artificial about it. People do not fake and things like that. But the challenge comes when they get to know that you are studying them. They can be in trouble, or they will just change their behavior. The next method we'll look at is the survey research method. And the survey method is defined as the method of collecting standardized information by interviewing a representative sample of a given population. So here, it is not all the people of interest that you target, but you select some. You pick a subset of it, and then you either give them a questionnaire, or you interview them, or sometimes you engage in both. So survey is applicable to a wide range of issues 
may take the form of group interview, administration of a questionnaire in a classroom, and things like that. That's what happened in the survey. So collecting standardized information from people using an interview or self-report. And most of the time, the things that we use survey to study has to do with people's attitude, people's knowledge about an issue, people's opinion on issues of concern to the researcher. And sometimes to standardize the information that you collect means that you must have the questionnaire with a set questions. Everybody should be given the same questions to be answered. And the questionnaire have to be validated. It has to be validated. It needs to have good psychometric properties. And as I said, when it comes to survey, you are not dealing with all the people of interest, which is your population. That is not the people you deal with. You just pick a subset, which is called your sample. So it is very important that the sample that you pick will be quite representative of the population. If that happens, then your, the outcome of the survey, although being based on the sample, can be generalized to your population. So the target population, when it comes to the survey process, you need to know your target population, which is a known and a well-defined group from which your sample will be picked. You pick your sample, and then you do your data collection using a questionnaire or an interview, and then you analyze your method. So we can use interviews when it comes to survey. Interviews, most of the time, have several advantages. They are quite comprehensive. They ensure participants understand the question. It minimizes missing data, enables clarity of unclear responses, and stuff like that. However, it has some disadvantages too. Very expensive. People, most of the time, are more likely to refuse participation, especially if the questionnaire is quite huge, quite voluminous. And then also can be risky for the interviewer. Sometimes you have to go to certain places, and especially if you are dealing with a very hard to reach populations, you, you can really find yourself into trouble. We can also have group administration. Sometimes you just get to a classroom, talk to the lecturer concerned, and then you administer your questionnaire. Sometimes survey questions can be done over the telephones. You just call people randomly, find out their views and opinions about an issue of interest to you. Or sometimes you email them by mail, either by post or by email. So these are some of the survey methods that we use. Now let's look at the questions. The questions that we ask in the survey most of the time are of two types. We have open-ended questions and then closed-ended questions. Open-ended questions are those that we ask the participants to write their experiences, their typical experiences. So you can have a question like, can you tell me about your typical experience when you were dating so-so and so? This, they are at liberty to write whatever they want to write there. But when it comes to close-ended questions, there you give them options, and all they have to do is to select. Do you think abortion should be legalized? Yes, no. This is an example of a close-ended question. So survey questionnaires must be valid, as I said earlier, and they must be reliable. Experts have to construct them. Not everybody should do that. And the questionnaires may be designed for a specific topic, or if there is an existing one that serves the purpose of your research, you just fall on it, and then you use it. It could be open-ended or close-ended. So that's about survey. Then we have another method called case studies. And case study is an in-depth description or analysis of a single individual or a particular group or a single institution. As we said, it's a detailed study of a case, just one instance of it, just one. And that one is not so clearly defined. For example, it could be a study about one person it could be a study about a whole, uh, just an institution, a study about Legon is a case study. So we should be careful how we explain that case aspect of the case study. It is used to investigate, most of the time it is used to investigate real occurrences, real cases 
and can provide compelling portraits of individuals. Case studies can help us understand the particular situation in detail. The only challenge is that however detailed information we get from a case study, we cannot generalize it to other people because every case is unique and every case is different. So we should take note of that. Every case is unique and every case is different. Another method which we will look at is correlational studies. In correlational studies, what we seek to find is a relationship, a degree of relationship or association between two or more variables. We observe and measure two variables, and then we determine the degree to which the relationship between them exists, whether a change in one will lead to a change in the other. So when it comes to correlation, most of the time we talk about two types of correlation. We could have a positive correlation or a negative correlation. A positive correlation is where a change, an increase in one variable leads to an increase in the other. So for example, we can have studying hard and academic performance. You know, the more hours students put in in studying, the better the academic performance. This is a positive correlation. Or we can have a negative correlation is where an increase in one variable leads to a decrease in the other. So for example, the relationship between depression and happiness will be negative. When people are more depressed, their level of happiness comes down. So this will be a negative correlation. So we should note the, this relationship between the, the variables. We can have positive or negative relationship. Then another design that we have, another research method design that we have is ex post facto design. Ex post facto design means that after the fact or after the event, and this is a study that takes place after the event has happened. And it is so because most of the time the event of interest has already taken place. It has already occurred and we can't be able to manipulate it. So for example, we want to find out about um, uh, people's experiences about the Ebola that has happened in uh, our neighboring countries. You know, we cannot manipulate the Ebola. It has happened already. Or we can even try to find out in Ghana here when our neighbors were suffering from this Ebola, what was going on among us? Were we scared that it's going to come here or not? So in that instance, we cannot manipulate anything. The event has already happened. All that we try to do when it comes to ex post facto study is to find out what the causes are, whether we can link the causes to what has happened and what remedial action we can, we can take. So perhaps a study on domestic violence, on aggressive behavior. Domestic violence has happened already. We cannot manipulate it. We can't go and put somebody in somebody's house that to see if the person will be beating them or whatever, will molest them. We cannot do that. But once they have happened, we can go in and conduct this type of study. So that's about ex post facto design.